Hey, this sounds like it's on. Good girl, Lily. Amen. And now a few more months before the, before our girl turns 13, right, Michelle? Is it June or something? The end of July. Hmm, okay. Moving right along. Now, in case you don't remember, the book of Isaiah was written some 700, almost 800 years before Christ came. And so far, we're in uh, chapter 45, which means we're more than halfway through uh, this little Bible. Uh, when we first started, I made mention, and a few times during it, there's how many chapters in Isaiah? 66, just like the Bible. And if you were to take Genesis and you went with the first chapter of Isaiah and you just went through and you went to like Matthew, the first chapter of Matthew, you go to like, a, you know, because there's 39 books in the Old Testament, right? 27 in the New. So if you go to like the 39th chapter, next thing you know, there's a man crying in the wilderness. And since we're already saved, we already know who that is. We know that's John the Baptist. And it's just amazing how this book works. So... In all that that we we know about types and figures and all that stuff, still in the midst you got historical documentation about uh, 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 lands, you know these countries, these nations, the king's names, uh, all this verification to show you that what's in here about that archaeology and all these other things, land masses and demographics and all proven to be absolutely correct. There's no flaw in this book. Others will try to find flaws, but there's there's none. And uh, Plus, we all know that it's in here that are saved, that when we read the Bible, we read it differently than a lost person because we have the guidance of God. So God opens up things to you. He ain't going to open that up to other people. And uh, so when we're reading this, we see kings, places, situations. And most of the time, we see phases, almost like the book of Revelation. What do you mean phases? Like when we were doing that, we found that there's four different times certain things are mentioned in Revelation. And when you put them together, you find out, oh my goodness, they're, they just coincide, they go uh, uh, in order. That's why you can fit all that stuff in seven years. And the book of Isaiah, what you see is a pattern, right? You see God, uh, he, he's over and over again, he tells what? He says that he birthed them, he found them, he directs them, he protects them. And so here they are doing, next thing you know, what do they do? They look, looked at the other people and they said, man, it looks like they're having more fun than I am. So the next thing you know, boom, they go that way. And he didn't kill them right away. Shouldn't use that, like that term. But he allows them to go. And next thing you know, it's their kids. Then their kids grow up, right? Less information. And then their kid kids, pretty soon, who's God? What's God? Well, whatever they're, they're doing in, in Egypt or whatever they're doing in Syria or whatever they're doing in Babylon, it's just shows you about human nature and then God sends who prophets and what is the prophet doing when he shows up warning 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 what do they do they don't take heed so God does what puts them in captivity and here they are in captivity next you know they start whining different things like that right and he sends them another another prophet, another person. And um, what we're seeing here in Isaiah is we're seeing the warnings because they haven't went into Nebuchadnezzar yet. I mean, that didn't take place yet, right? He didn't take them over yet. Remember, see, when we preach or when we teach Old Testament, sometimes everything runs together. But you got to look at the dates. You got to look at who's contemporary. You know, what preachers are preaching at the same time. And I give you that little piece of paper at the beginning of this and I'll have to, maybe I'll put a bunch on the thing, but it shows you who's preaching when. And when you look at that, it helps you because when you get to the book of Daniel, you find out about the statue, you find out that God already told you what countries, what and where. Grecia, Persia, all those places ending in Rome, remember? With the feet. And uh, before the feet, rather. And then next thing you know, the feet come, and then now we got iron, and something else is mixed. So that means the Roman Empire is going to revive itself. And remember, the stone that comes, made without hands, hits the statue, crushes it. That's the second advent with the Lord coming back. 
Now we know that in Daniel. Hmm. Well, who preached before Daniel, before he was taken captivity? Jeremiah. To me, I think Jeremiah comes after Isaiah. Last time I checked. And uh, so, a lot of times people preach, we get excited about sermons, then we go home and say, where in the world did they get that? I mean, what they said was right, but wait a minute, you know. And for years I was wondering a certain direction, you know, we get our three points in outline, we preach and everything, and finally I found in Jeremiah all the things that look just like America, what America's going through, and what the world's going through, and I'm saying, man, and God's cry was what? Return to the old paths. To find what? Rest for your souls. And what did Israel tell him? Nah, we're not going to. And so that's, they go into captivity because of that, right? But also, when you read Daniel, Daniel's the book that tells you about the 70th, 70 weeks, and uh, or 70 years, and tells you how the thing's broken down for the seven-year tribulation period. But at the beginning of all that, you know what he says? This is what Jeremiah the prophet said. So when I heard that, I said, hmm, well, here he is teaching and preaching end time. And he got it from Jeremiah, this start. We know we got it from God, but I mean, he mentions by name. And uh, I'm saying this because you need to understand that Jeremiah thought he had no converts. He is called the weeping preacher, wrote a whole book called Lamentations, because he knows that all his preaching and everything, he seems to be in vain because these people are going in captivity. He sees that. So he dies not knowing that he even did anything, actually, except warn. But I'll bet you when he got up to glory, next thing you know, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Yeah. And you got Daniel. So apparently they read Jeremiah and they understand what's going on and knew why they were in captivity. So Jeremiah had more fruit, just like you and I, Simpletons, we go in and out, we backslide, we get back to God, we do this, that, 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 that all up and down. You're not going to know actually what you really had an impact in until you get up there. You know. I mean, God even used people backsliding. You know that? If they're his kids. I'm not saying that's where you're supposed to be. I'm just saying God's going to use you, believe it or not. And I believe he does it because he loves us and wants us to have something up there to ever see. He's not trying to get a burn pile going. Amen. So your preacher, that's what I'm trying to do, is just give you body, soul, and spirit, show you how to work it, work through it. Yeah. And in these last days, whew. all right, so where are we at? Well, we're in chapter 45, last time I checked, and we're going from verse 5 all the way to verse 19. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Now this section, verses 5 to 19, it's already been covered in pre previous chapters with, with some variance. When I say covered, that means it handled everything as uh, subject matter as we're going through that. Why well, I read it? Because there's always little things in everything in God's word. It's word, and words are very important, correct? And uh, so in verse 5, for instance, and verse 6, I, I want you to see something about verse 5. Go to Isaiah 44, we were just there, and look at verse uh, 7, 44, 7. And who, as I shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them shew unto them. So, talking about God, talking about prophecy, talking about what's going on, and that was in that verse, and we covered that, believe it or not. Now let's look at verse 5 and 6 of chapter 45. The Bible says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Now that's a very important verse, because that's showing people don't even know it's God that's been protecting them, been watching over them. Do you see that? And he's telling you there's only one, that's me. Not Muhammad or Muhammad's God. Different God they worship. They say there's only one God. His name is Mo, Mo, Baloney. Anyway, no, his name is Allah. I'm sorry. And if you look at the Aramaic, I guess Allah would be one God. And yeah. But there's a disconnect. 
for what they believe about the one God because they say Allah had no son. Yeah, anyway, that's verse 5. Talk about I am the Lord and there's none else. So if you were arguing with somebody or somebody says, well, you mean there's more than one God? You can take them right there. You can just That's a simple one. Isaiah 45, 5. Isaiah 45, 5. You ain't got to memorize it. Just remember the address. Isaiah 45, 5. And then they'll say, I bet. And then you pull out. And, well, you got a Bible? Let me see your Bible. Make sure it's King David. Pull out and read it. Say, what does that say? Well, I know that's what it says. That's what it says. There's only one God. Anyway. Okay. Be tough about it. Verse 6. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. So at first he's protecting them, he's doing all that, unaware to them, the people that he's doing it for. You know, that he's doing it. The next verse is saying now they need to be aware, right? Let them know. So God wants all to know who he is. You see verse 7 there. Verse 7 says, I from the light and create, I'm sorry, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create what? Evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Man, will people take verses like that and run with it? See, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good witch. I'm a this, I'm a that. See, God created that stuff. I'll show you the verse. You say, no way. Oh, yes way. So we just want, God wants to let them know that he is in charge of light, darkness, evil, and peace. Now this verse, or verses, explain the creation of evil. Yes, they do. Go to, go to Psalm 78, 49. Once again, your preacher's handicapped, right? So I want to see this. Isaiah, uh, whatever I said. Oh, Psalm, I'm sorry, 78. Psalm 78. Where did Psalm go? Okay. There we go. Psalm 78 and verse 49. Psalm 78, verse 49 says this. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble. Now look what it says. By sending evil what? angels among them. Man, he created all that. No, no. The, ev the evil angels are already there. Remember Lucifer went to Satan, the devil. Angels left the first estate. There are angels there that are already evil that he uses. Remember the book of Revelations where the four angels come and they, from the river, he says that they were in bondage or in chains. It means they were already there. They were already evil. He uses them. He did not create sin. See, the devil created that with pride of his heart. And darkness was created because of him doing that. And then he uses darkness after that. And therefore, a lot of times people will find two or three verses in the Bible and say, well, see, darkness is good. If God's using it for good, fine. But that is not the whole idea of darkness because throughout the Bible, all them scriptures are telling you, hey, man, you're a light, you're not a darkness. All the way to the end of the book of Revelation where he does away with darkness. No more night girls. But at any rate, you're seeing this verse here. And we are talking about Isaiah, talking about how when he talks about creating evil and all this stuff, people are, uh, will come up with all sorts of explanations to try to devise some kind of philosophy where uh, they can get along with whatever sin they're doing. But it's not right. So we, uh, because of rebellion, God sends evil angels. And uh, we see that. Go to Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49. Keep going to the right of your Isaiah there. Jeremiah 49. <sighs> Jeremiah 49. And uh, verse 37 says this. Yep. For I will cause Elam. Remember, Elam was Jerusalem. To be dismayed before their enemies. And before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. And I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. So God is using that evil, right? And he's not doing it against good people. He's doing it against his people that rebelled. 
And um, then also, Elam is promised evil. Go to Ezekiel 5. Ezekiel 5. I wonder if when I'm teaching everything in my old age, how many when they listen, if they just go crazy, if they just say, hey, why don't that preacher get to the point? Why don't that preacher get to the point? Anyway, sorry. So Ezekiel 5 and verses 16 and 17. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine, evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. I mean, I'm talking, these things, man, the, all these things that he does does not prove God as evil, but we understand he permits and ordains it in his judgment. And here, back to Isaiah 45, verses 9 and 10, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker, let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Everybody know what potsherds are? That's the pile of pottery that's already been broken up and laying down there from the potter's hands. So he's saying, okay, you guys, you get together, you just hang out together then. You know, forget about me, the maker, right? <laughs> it says, um, shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, what makest thou? Or thy work, uh, he hath no hands. Something to think about, right? Phew. And then you got 10. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begatest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. Wow. Well, it begins with a woe. It begins with a woe. And uh, from our studies, we know this is not a good thing. Uh, we also notice in verse 9 and 11 the work, uh, the word rather, maker. And it's capitalized, indicating a reference to God. Now once again, the illustration of clay and potter. Israel has a justification <laughs> or final design. That is for sure. Israel does? Yes. Go to Romans 9. See, even now, do you know you have... I mean, we're talking millions of Jews that believe they're even getting better with Jesus. They're saying he was a good guy. He's a good teacher. He brought people together and he divided people. And we will concede that he was born Jewish, but he's not the Messiah, right? Now, see, God already knows there's going to be a remnant that's going to believe it. He already knows all that excitement. They don't know. See, so when it happens to them, we don't say, told you so. We're sort of excited. You know, we already know who he is, but we're excited when that, when that happens to them. See, God knows this stuff. We, we, we got no idea uh, what's going on. Romans chapter 9. I think it's after Acts. Let's see. All right, Romans 9. Verse 21. Good old potter's used again. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump? Do you get that? That's something you need to see. The same lump. To make one vessel unto honor and one another unto dishonor. Has God got the power to do that? Yes, he does. The verse in Isaiah talks about pot shed. And when you hear that word, you remember Job, all them sores and boils? He used broken pottery to ugh, cut them all off. You know, that's just getting all the pus out. Just <laughs> that's what Job did. And so in Isaiah, God's saying, okay, you guys don't want to recognize I'm maker? And you're broken up, you're laying all around? Well, guess what? 
you're going to hang around with them other people that, are, that think the same thing. I'll put you all in a lump, lump thing over there. And what's going to happen? Well, guess what? God could make that whole bunch on the dishonor. He can mold them and use them in his plan of dishonor. But what I like is it says the same lump. That means he's not through with the clay. Why is that good? It's good for us, man. <laughs> yeah. When we think we're without hope, nah. He can make you again. He can do that a thousand times. And then you get Patricia do a study of that, that potter. I mean, we've had it preached. I've did some illustrations. Man, some of the greatest messages I heard was on that. You study what a potter does with clay, how he gets it. You know, how he'll get a broken one, not, not one that's uh, uh, broken off. He'll get a cracked one, cracked all through there. And how they can tell is they'll get a, they'll get a vase, vase or something. And they do this also, uh, people that are, uh, they assess and see how, you know, if it's an antique and how much of it. They put a light in there, even in good china. And it does something. They can tell from the light on the inside what it does. So on these that are that have a bunch of cracks, it's amazing what the potter will do. He'll put that candle, that light in there, and he can go around and he can see all the little cracks. So instead of taking that and throwing it against the wall and with the other ones and then remake them, he'll get some clay and he'll get the water. And he'll go and he'll do all the cracks. And when he's all done working that thing, you, it was never cracked. And that's a good illustration. When you start to, God puts that in there for us to look at it, right? So even though you're cracked up, a little crazy, God can come along and fix that thing up. I like it. I like the illustrations like that. So here we see that uh, the problem is the clay not recognizing <laughs> who the potter is. All right, back to Isaiah. 45, look at verse uh, 10 again. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Huh. That's like kids, right? Right, Michelle? I mean, really, when you, you had to have those, Michelle had, to have times like that. I had times growing up like that. What the flip am I living for? Never had a dad? I mean, it's obvious you got a dad because you're here, but I never saw him. Never knew I had it. I had to put up with all that junk with school kids and the whole stinking thing because of that, not having one. I couldn't run. I had to lie. I had to make lies, you know, about your family tree and all that stuff, you know. And uh, it's amazing the stuff that we go through. And um, at that time, we're cursing actually God, right? Because if you're cursing your mother, you're cursing God. He knows where you are. So what are you supposed to do? Well, you pray for your mother. You know, and uh, doesn't mean you condone. And that, what that means is you, you don't agree with everything that they do. But the idea that you're here, thank God she didn't abort you. Even though at times you say, man, I've been better off because I wouldn't have to suffer all that stuff if, she, if I was never born. Matter of fact, I think Job mentioned that. He went through so much stuff that that was a no-no with God. But anyway, one of the no-nos in Job. But as you see that, you're looking at these verses saying, you can't really, well, you condemn him for not believing that he's the main potter, that he's the main God. But you have to wonder why they sort of wish they weren't born or don't like their parents. And when you go back, God's not getting on the kids, see, right away. He's getting on the parents because they didn't teach the kids. Kids are growing up without that knowledge. Now, they're all going to be involved in judgment because God don't play that. But he's letting you know their attitude. And their attitude was defilement of their parents. You know, a lot of them, if you look at the, the context of what's going on, you got incest, you got all this stuff going on, worshiping certain body parts. All these things are happening in this time that happened way back before the flood. And, and I'm talking about before the flood. And then after the flood, bunch of heathens. First thing they do, the Hittites and all that. If you don't even want to study that in the library. One time I made a mistake and told my kids to go uh, study the Hittites, right? Next thing you know, man, they ain't saying nothing. Some of them are embarrassed. I'm saying, what's going on? Did my one, well, Tim, you know, because he's a reader, he showed me the book. I'm looking. It's pornography, man. It's pornography. I didn't know how bad it was. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just human nature. 
arm loose with no discipline. Besides that, when you're done, they chop heads off, they drink blood, you know, all that good stuff, you know. And now we're living in a society that, what, is starting to promote this stuff, including the tendon fuse with the blood. I don't know if you know about that, but amen. Some dude used Nikes, and Nikes is suing him now. Some high-class dude made devilish designs on his Nikes and sacrificed blood. That was the statement. And so, guess what? A bunch of young people rushed out to buy them. That's getting a little crazy, isn't it? No, it's a spirit thing. Spirit thing. You can't see the spirit, but you feel it. Crazy stuff. So anyway, verse 10 continues with the uh, child born having no right to that choice, if you really think about it. Almost like an abortion thing. It didn't happen, but they're living. Verse 12, and here we go again about uh, our uh, creators creating. And plus is added, all the host of heaven is added. And uh, so you, you look at that and you say, hmm, let's see. Okay, verse 11, let's say it the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, capital M, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. Verse 12, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Verse 13, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives, not for the price nor reward, saith the Lord. All capital L's big time there in King James of hosts. So we look at that, we know that Hezekiah recognizes God uh, in creation, and in his prayer, if you remember, about Sennacherib in Isaiah 37, 16. If we remember, God did something with the son with Hezekiah's prayer. I mean, you just don't move the son. Degrees. You know, everybody and their mother that was on earth freaked out because they got sun dials, right? They're saying, wait a minute. It wasn't like they wore them around their wrist and said, oh man, what's going on? Did they move, did they move it's almost like our man control trying to say to like God, oh, we'll just wake up an hour early, some hour late. No, he moved his son. And you all remember that with Joshua, he moved his son. And mathematicians and everything put the degrees on and proved that there was a movement historically in those times. Huh. what's that? I don't have to re believe all of them. I just believe what it says here. He did it. So naturally, the verses that I'm reading, somebody that doesn't like God, don't want God, they ain't going to believe that. They say, yeah, but that says God did that. I don't believe God did that. Well, it don't matter if they believe it or not. It did. But as we're studying, it's, it's amazing that even science backs a lot of this stuff up. Verse 13, you're wondering about the hymn that's in that verse? Well, that verse is Cyrus. Yeah. And you look at verse 14. In other words, that's his anointed. That's who he chose, remember? Verse 14. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God, now look what it says, is what? In thee. And there is none else. <laughs> there is no God. <laughs> I like this stuff. Why? Because I just like it. Man, I know it's Cyrus in 13. You talk about men of stature. is a reference. What you need to see is it's a reference of height. Not whether they're kings or nothing, but of heights. So you got a group coming over, right? If you remember, now you don't have to go there, but I will give the reference. If you remember, you have uh, the tent, the spies that went over to spy out the land as they were going to leave the wilderness, if they did everything right. You have Joshua and uh, uh, Caleb coming back. The only good report there was by faith, right? But if you remember, they reported in Numbers 13, 22, 
about men of stature, giants in the land. We were as grasshoppers, they said. And uh, also in 2 Samuel 21, 21, you've got uh, a great stature again, and that's giants. David's mighty men fighting the Egyptians of great stature is in 1 Chronicles 11, 33. So if you're going to use a Strong's, once again, not for the Greek or the Hebrew, but the final references, if you looked up uh, stature, uh, height, you'd find all these references. And they go back to David and the sling. We know they had, he had brothers. And we know that the mighty men of David finally slew him. We know that David had a problem with the first one. And that's why he allowed the mighty men to do it. God said, you let the mighty man take care of business, not you. <laughs> you know? And so I think it's neat to see this, that we're talking about Cyrus, and we're talking about people bowing down to him as emperor. So that means the, the known world at that time was under Cyrus. And in Daniel, it talks about the Medes and the Persians as you're going down for the, you know. So after Babylon, you got Cyrus coming on the scene. So God's already, so many hundred years is already telling you, hey, my man's coming, my anointed one's coming, like I told you last week. And this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to take place. And uh, what a blessing, because we know that he just happens to be a friend of Israel. So we know God can withdraw himself. We know that. And when this occurs, it is a lonely, <laughs> unsecure, or insecure emotion. We know that. How do you know that? Go to Psalms 10. Verse 1, Psalm 10 and verse 1. The Bible says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in time of trouble? And when you go through that verse, you're going to see David, when he's crying out, he, he doesn't sense God. He doesn't see God. He doesn't, sometimes you go through life like that. But the, what surrounds him is wicked people. And so when the fear comes because of other people, you ask yourself, why am I fearing? What's going on here? I mean, I believe in God. What's happening here? And then, you, then the devil gets you going, and he starts saying, where's God? Where's God? That's a lonely feeling. Now, why would God allow that to happen, you wonder? Well, over the years, this is what I believe takes place. When you take things for granted, but your heart lies to you all the time. No, I am humble. I'm not taking it for granted. Yeah, you are. You don't even miss God because everything's going okay. You know, you ask people over and over again, like I said last Sunday, the reason you ain't, you, you don't have any strength in here is you're not reading every day. You just ain't going to read. And I'm going to tell you who I talked to, and I looked right in the eyeballs, and I said, you just ain't reading every day because something ain't getting through. He goes, I know. Well, it's good to admit that, but man, it's dangerous. Whew. Because, you know, your past life, if you had a bad one, you're talking about my black dog? Whoa. I'm feeding that bad boy. We got problems, you know. <laughs> Where are you supposed to feed the white one? Why oh, you're being a racist? I'm sorry. It's an Indian proverb. Take it up with the Indians. Talked about feeding, right? Whatever you feed the most is the thing that's going to dominate. So when you look at this, you got David. A lot of his accomplishments, and uh, always close to God, and all of a sudden God says no. It's not because, it doesn't have to be because of disobedience or you just, it, it's, it's about growing your faith. Because the longer you despair shows you how less of a life of faith you have, right? Because it gets deeper, it don't get better. So that's when you come back and God say, oh God, man, you know, help, help my belief or something. Work, show me something. You know, and he comes through, he cheers you up and that lasts for a while. Go to, uh, you were in Psalms, go to chapter 44, 44, Psalm 44, and uh, we're talking about loneliness, right? And let's see, verse 24, here it is again. Wherefore, hidest thou thy face, and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? And remember the last verse was surrounded with wickedness, here is with oppression, right? You see that? And affliction. These things are what causes it, because you're wondering, hey, hey, God, like a bellhop, right? 
you know I'm sick, you know I got pain. Come on, man, what's taking you so long, basically? <laughs> this ain't right. You always let me, everything was okay, man. What's going on here? Why are you taking so long? You know, it's a part of maturing. The older you get, you know. He is not a bellhop. He is not your spare tire. And you're, you know, whenever you get a flat, then you need it. No, he's not like that. And he's trying to teach us that. And then also, same Psalms. Made, made <laughs> David all stuff he's been through. That's why I like reading the Psalms. I mean, even with the Bathsheba, right? So what is that? That's like pornography, isn't it? I mean, he, he knew where she was. Oh, yeah. And on the rooftop, he just kept walking and walking and walking until he checked her out taking that, that shower, right? And what did he say in his heart? i got to have that. Now, was he king? Yeah. How many women could he have? Thousands. He had thousands. He's a king. And that's a violation of God. Well, God didn't say anything in the Old Testament for a whole lot of that stuff. He knew it would cause problems. He warned them. But it's like Solomon never killed him. What does that tell you about uh, uh, human nature? Solomon had what? How many wives? 300. How many concubines? They played the part of a wife, right? 800? You know, how can that be? Well, nowadays, they'll just work through pornography. They could watch, right, Chris? I mean, you could watch thousands. I mean, really? That's human nature. So the based animal is not under control. And so God, when you're, when you're looking at these things with David, we already know about Bathsheba. It hadn't happened yet. There's only what? No, it, yeah, it has happened. I'm sorry. There's 89. Not, not, and uh, man, and the prophet even told him, he could have had any sheep he wanted. Why do you take another man's sheep? So I'm just showing you that in the scripture, a lot of places, normally we inflict ourselves. So God steps away to get us to think, you know. And uh, thank goodness we're saved and sealed. Amen. So we know that uh, as we're going through here with Cyrus, we know verse 13, the hymn is Cyrus. We know that uh, we're going through these verses on uh, God being away, loneliness, 15, 16. We know that um, the makers of idols are easily led to confusion, meaning if you got other gods in your life, I don't care if it's sports, I don't care what it is. If that's above God, that leads you into blindness because now you're thinking everything's acceptable and you forgot about how close you were with God before and you don't know how far away you are. You, you look at that in 16. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. 16 says, they shall be ashamed, okay, uh, and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel, look what it says, shall be what? Saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. So we know that the makers of idols are easily led to confusion. And now we didn't get to the verse yet but uh, until next week, but in verse 25, the last verse, it says this, In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So it's just an amazing thing to see that. So in 25, that went with 17. But verse 18, God is the creator again of all seen and not seen. And uh, we'll continue that later because that's going to involve uh, Romans chapter 1. So verse 18 is requiring Romans 1 to go along with it. And it will be April, right? So tomorrow's April Fools. So, oh, fools. So I can tell you guys anything tonight, right? Tonight. No, I gotta wait till tomorrow. Okay. And uh, hmm. so that'd be like April, April, something. So everybody understand? I mean, wasn't that confusing? I mean, you made it through. Another one. Little flock. I'm trying to give it all I can give it. That's all I can do. And uh, and I am here for counsel. I mean, yep. You can make a list. Yep, I can help you. All right, let's pray. Father.